hope everybody's doing well. Uh, praise God. So I really don't have a lot to share today. Um, I'll probably sound like I'm ranting as always, but uh, the scripture has been on my, on my, on my heart for the past uh, few days, and I'm going to read it to you. This is Hebrews 10. Uh, verses 35 and 36. Therefore, do not throw away your confidence, which has a great reward. For you have need of endurance, so that when you have done the will of God, you may receive what is promised. You know, uh, I don't know if it's because uh, I've been approached by some people that have kind of uh, Vented things to me or whatever, uh, or things that are happening. But I do know this: I know that every day that passes, one, I have more assurance that what God has promised me is manifesting as we speak. And two, I continue to get confirmation of the things that. Uh, he has promised me. Like I, I talked to my wife on Monday, and uh, we're still having this disagreement on a lot of specific uh, matter. But then during the conversation, she's like, "Oh yeah, you know, let me, let me just uh, backtrack a little. When when she left last year, she took all the furniture. So." <laughs> Now I'm getting it back. <laughs> so, you know, the Lord has always shown me that he's going to provide for me and take care of me. But I think it's funny because now that I'm getting it back, someone already gave me a couch. <laughs> so I got to figure out what I'm going to do with it. Uh, yeah. Because uh, for many months I had a bed in my living room that I was using as my sofa. But, yeah. Anyway. <laughs> no, but this is an actual bed. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's true. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, little by little, she keeps reinserting herself into my life. And, you know, whatever she says, oh, you're this and that, I'm going to do this and this and that. Okay, okay. She can say whatever she wants. He already told me what he's going to do. Who am I going to believe? You know? Uh, yeah, that's one thing. Then uh, another one is to ask you to stand with me uh, for my sister. Uh, things are kind of getting worse for her. Not in like a illness type of way, but spiritually speaking. Right now, she's saying some things that if she makes those things public, it's going to destroy my entire family. Uh, so I don't know what her problem is. To me, it seems that she refuses to let go of the past, and she's still holding, holding on to grudges for things people did to her, uh, which is actually one of the first things that I learned that the Holy Spirit revealed to me when I gave my life to the Lord is that the past is never going to get you anything other than wisdom, but it's not going to bring you anything because you can't change it. Right, right. Uh, so I would appreciate if we, uh, you know, if, if you can stand with me in, in binding whatever it is that is uh, oppressing her, you know, like I said, like, like, like we said on Sunday, this world is trying to hold the children of God captive. Mm -hmm. And, you know, in that video that I shared with you that Mike as well, uh, there's a law back in, in, in Puerto Rico that any church that wants, wishes to have a school needs to be licensed by the Puerto Rico Board of Education. Well, now the government is trying to 
uh, revoke that law so they can dictate what churches teach children that go to their schools. And uh, my nephew, which actually happens to go to uh, a private school that's from a church, <coughs> that his class actually made a video that that's the video that Suzanne was watching earlier today. And this girl, 15 years old, she's giving these, uh, I'm not gonna call it a speech, I'm gonna call it a declaration. Because she was standing for what she believes, what the Lord has revealed to her. And I know everybody there stands for that. And you know, even though we're not physically there, I say we join them in spirit and we declare that no one from this world is going to dictate how the children of God are going to, uh, I don't know, I guess grow or, or learn. He's the one that's gonna give us our knowledge, our wisdom. Yes, we have to go to school because we have to learn certain things so we can perform things in the world, you know, but, you know, we are, uh, like Jesus said in the Bible, you preached about this recently, you know, the wind's going to come, it's already blowing, and we are building the foundation of our lives with something that it's stronger than oak, and that's the word of God. So our house is going to stand no matter what pressure comes against it, Amen. and I declare that the same thing is going to happen there, and everywhere that whoever at any particular moment says, Lord, this is your house, my life is yours, at that very moment, that foundation is gonna start being built. Amen. Amen. So, that's my little rant for the week until Amen. Sunday, I guess. <laughs> I gotta make a note, I gotta prepare my next one, yes.
So, you know, we really need to pray because, as you said, medical, this is, it's an excellent generation, but it's also a generation that doesn't have any of the supports that we've had in the past. They're basically flying right in the face of the enemy. And, uh, and we all know this to be true, even though it seems cliche. We're always just one generation away from losing everything. Well, and, and, you know, the foundation of this nation, like it says in the Declaration of Independence, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator. You know, it talks about God. And if you go to the Constitution of the Commonwealth of Puerto Rico, the very first sentence says, putting our trust in God Almighty. You know? foundation of I don't know almost every nation that I can think of it's with what in God yeah. US currency the one dollar what does it say in the back in God we trust but I don't know the state sometimes like to take scriptures and uh, use them to their benefit like the truth shall fill you free that's not a confession that's not what it means anyway Anyone else wants to share anything? <laughs> I was praying for my brother David. <clears throat> Is he the one that lives in Minnesota? No, he's in Florida. Oh, okay. All right. Mike. We pray for uh, the gentleman who passed away a month or Sunday when I got here. Mm. Uh, his family. Uh, family. Uh, just this is a revelation of what is going on. Um, to find the answers, <coughs> possibly turn off any other situations that may result in the same situation.
So does he have any, have any, does he have any family? In CC. Okay, so was it, now was his dad a C, the C, the same name? Yeah. Okay, yeah. Then I, I did, I did a name search and stuff and I saw that he had a father of the same name yeah. and stuff like that. And the, the strange part about it is, I was talking to Pastor, <coughs> is his father died two months before my dad died four years ago. And uh, Patrick was, couple years younger than me, um, and his dad was a vet who got out of, out of, the, uh, uh, out of the service in 58, my dad got out of service in 56, but I've seen the timeline there, that was, so I, I don't know what caught, may have caused him not to go to rehab and everything else like that, did he, did he start when his dad passed away? Well, I think that could possibly be it, because he had been sober for years. Yeah. And then relapsed. And okay. It was okay. alcohol. And yeah, yeah. He came to treatment. Yeah, okay, okay. All right, so we can pray for his family in Sioux City and stuff. Appreciate that. You bet. Thanks for sharing. Certainly. Yes, ma'am. That doesn't answer some of the questions at least. Amen. Amen.
two years at the beginning of April. <laughs> so it is it is the you know the external factor that draws people. Which sometimes it does, it brings up those churches that make the April churches go, hey, I think that one's possible. So it isn't it isn't certainly isn't the, uh, the grandeur of the place or the or the numbers or any of that. It's just God just likes those people that way to fit. Mm. <laughs> no, we love hearing. I was thinking what you were talking about uh, things coming against you know God's promises in the New World Order and so on. So thanks for that. And I, I was reminded of when we took the tour of this church. Uh, we were down on the south side of the road in front of the Home Service and the trailer park and that uh, community place next to the trailer park. And uh, the Lord. I, <laughs> you know, because I mean, if you're a pastor, people want to say, well, you've got, you've got some kind of sin that you do to do. But anyway, Gary had asked me to take a tour of the Utah for a while. And I, I told him, I said, look, I'll help you just, uh, you know, you probably just burned out. I know what it's like. You're in your own water. And there's no structure. You know, you have your own. So I said, I'll just, you know, if you want me to just kind of preach for you once in a while, I'll do that. And we'll, we'll find you a proper church. And I said, that was 12 months ago. 
All right, well, let's stand. <laughs> oh, Heavenly Father, we thank you for bringing us together in your presence, Lord. We thank you for your faithfulness. We thank you for the revelation that you give us, Lord. The confidence that you, that you give us and that we believe your promises, Father. We know, Lord, that your word is true. We know that you will never, ever fail us. You never abandon us. Thank you, Father, we call to you right now for those that are in need of healing, those that are sick or recuperating from anything right now, Lord, we declare that the healing that you have confessed over us is manifesting in this body. Father, we pray for that gentleman that will pass away here Sunday night. Father, his family, give him comfort. Friday, the 13th, spooky, yeah. we have <laughs> Eastern Gate House of Prayer. It's going to be a blessed day like every day, Amen. so it's going to be good. And now let's speak the word. Will you not revive us again that your people may rejoice in you? No. 
Thank you, Jesus. Praise God. Thank you, Lord. Praise God. Hallelujah, Jesus. We love you, Lord. Praise God. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, we love you tonight. We bless you and praise you. Thank you for this precious gift of life, Lord. That by giving it to us, we might live to know you, to experience you. Hallelujah, Jesus. We just bless you tonight and praise you. Thank you, Lord, for your goodness, for your favor, for your faithfulness. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah, Jesus. Everybody say praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Amen. God bless you. You may be seated. Hallelujah. Thank you, Mike and worship team. Hallelujah. I'll be brief tonight because I've already talked for 45 minutes. <laughs> It's only fair, I guess. So. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Hallelujah is right. Praise the Lord. I, you know, I uh, Sunday I want to talk a little bit more about uh, not really evangelism, but how how we can reach out to others, how we can. It's not about trying to enlarge this church, uh, increase the numbers. Although all of that's good, and it just that that just shows that we're reaching somebody, that we're touching somebody. But more importantly, we we are all evangelists every day, everywhere that we go, all that we do. And uh, I don't want to get ahead of myself, but it's just been on my mind. I, I it's just that you know. We want to present Jesus to people who otherwise wouldn't know him. And we want to represent him sometimes to people who know him, but know him in a bogus way, in, a, in an unreal way. We want people to know how much God loves them. He loves them so much that he gave himself for them, whoever they are, wherever they are, whether they're, whether they're believers today or they're far from God. I mean, one of the most powerful uh, scriptures in my mind is that that how while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. I mean, that's a big deal. Not not after the fact, and not after we came to know Him. Not after we became uh, better people, or you know, whatever. Uh, but just when we were totally alienated from Him had nothing to do with him when he didn't care about him. He died for us. And we need to see other people that same way. Uh, however, however they are, whatever their condition, God loves them. He wants them saved. He wants their lives to be changed. He wants them to be blessed. He wants them to experience his life in this world. Praise the Lord. So if sometimes it seems like I overdo uh, grace, it's only because most of us have lived under other things for a long time. And we really need to have that reality of this God and how good he is established in us so that we can project that to the people that we come into contact. It isn't always uh, what we're saying. It's just the way we're living, you know, just the way we live out our lives. You know, I'm not talking about being perfect. I'm talking about being at peace. You know, having a sense of things are going to be okay. God's going to take care of it. God's going to be all, be right there for me, you know. That sense of just, you know, keep my head up and everything's going to be all right. Amen. People need that. Just You don't know how many people are dragging through life just, just not day by day, moment by moment, and uh, ready to give up, you know, ready to just throw it in and just say, you know, it's just not worth the struggle. Believe me. I've been there. I mean, I know what it is to feel that way. But 
other, on the other side of that is I found out that it, it's worth it's worth it. It's worth hanging on. It's worth it's worth pressing through. It's worth believing God because He has got great and mighty things for our lives. No matter how old we are, no matter what our background is, He's good and He wants to do good to all of us. Praise the Lord. Okay, now I said I wouldn't be long, so I gotta just quit rambling. Second Corinthians chapter ten and verse five. Second Corinthians chapter ten and verse five. Casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Now, just leave that up there for a moment. That is the opposite of religion. Because religion says obedience will bring acceptance. Amen. But the scriptures teach us that acceptance brings obedience. It works just the opposite of what religion tries to tell us. Religion says, if you behave, if you believe, then you can belong. Amen? Mm -hmm. If you act right, if you talk right, then you'll be accepted. Then you, then you can belong. <laughs> I mean, we do that with churches all the time. And that's what religion does. That's the impression. That's, that's the the kind of the attitude that, w that is projected to non-believers as well as believers. Mm -hmm. But let's look at Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 through 10. The scripture says, if we belong, then believe, obedience will take care of itself in Jesus. Yeah. Amen. In other words, we got to believe that we belong, that we are in the beloved. Amen. Then if we belong then we will believe. Mm -hmm. And the result is Jesus will take care of the rest. Amen. For by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It's the gift of God. Not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Mm -hmm. Now if God ordains it, how many of you believe it's going to happen? Amen. If he said it, it's going to happen. Praise the Lord. So first comes grace, then belief, and then God works. Amen. It's Jesus said, look, the works that I do, it's not me, but it's the Father that's in me. He doeth the works. Yeah. So you've got to believe. First, grace comes, which, which gives us access to God, even though we're all messed up. He just says, come on, just as you are. I, I accept you. I love you. Amen. It's that way for the whole world. And the result of that grace then is belief. Then we believe yes. that God's good, that God wants to do good in my life, that God wants to do good for me and through me, right? And the result of that belief is God starts working. Amen. He starts working through you even before you know he's working. Come on now. He starts impacting without you even being aware of it sometimes, right? All right? So we've been taught in the past that works come from us first. Right? We, gotta, we, we think of it as repentance. We think of repentance as a work. When truth, truthfully, repentance is a change of mind. Mm -hmm. yeah. But we think, I've got to get my act together here and clean this mess all up and get myself straightened out, and then God will accept me. No! While you were yet sinners. Mm -hmm. Amen? It's, it's not that way at all. Look at Galatians chapter 2 and verse 16. Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. Even we have believed in Jesus Christ that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. So no matter how many of the commandments you keep, you cannot be justified by it. Because right. you'll still miss it. You'll still come short somewhere. I mean, God said he did. All have come short of the glory of God. Everybody. 
from the Pope to everybody outside of Jesus has come up short, has failed in some way or another. But that is religion. It's empty works. Religion is do, 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 do good, do better, you know, work, work, work. And that is the opposite of what Jesus is trying to establish here. Because no matter what you do, nobody can be justified by the works of the law. No one. Amen? It's only by the grace of God. All right, let me, let's move along quickly. Nehemiah chapter 8 and verse 10. The Old Testament is nothing but grace uh, hidden. It's there. It's everywhere. It's all pointing to Jesus, but it's, 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 it's hidden there. And in the New Testament, it's all exposed. But it's the same message. It's just the way that it's presented. So in verse 10 here of Nehemiah, Chapter 8. He says, Then he said unto them, Go your way, eat the fat, and drink the sweet, and send portions unto them for whom nothing is prepared. For this, I love this. Eat the fat. How many of you like ribs? Oh, no. <laughs> Praise the Lord. <laughs> yeah. I think the Lord likes barbecue, to be quite honest with you. <laughs> eat the fat. Drink the sweet. And send portions unto them for whom nothing is prepared. For this day is holy unto our Lord. Neither be ye sorry, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. Praise God. Amen. It doesn't say do good works. It doesn't say exercise your spiritual, you know, behaviors. It says your, your strength will not be hard work, but it will... But your, the Lord, amen, hard work will, is not going to be your strength. Effort is not going to be your strength. Energy is not going to be your strength. Works are not going to be your strength. The joy that comes from your God, amen, the joy that comes from the Lord will be your strength. It comes from Him. It, does have, it doesn't come from you. It doesn't come from anything you're doing. It comes from the Lord. Praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. It's the joy that comes from God. Look at Psalms chapter 51 and verse 12. Restore unto me the joy, and look at this closely. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. And uphold me with thy free spirit. The joy of thy salvation. Not my salvation. It's not my work. It's God's work of grace. Praise the Lord. It's not about me. It's God's grace. It's God's joy. It's God's strength. And it's freely given to us. Praise God. We don't do anything except believe. That's all we got to do. It's the joy of the Lord. He gives me the joy. Amen? That's my strength. It isn't in what I'm doing. Look at Isaiah chapter 7 and verse 14. Now this is quoted in Matthew, but I'm not going to go there. Just, we'll just deal with this one here in Matthew or excuse me, in Isaiah. Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. Emmanuel meaning God with us, right? So Christ in you, the hope of glory. The Lord himself shall give you a sign. The sign will be Christ in you. Amen? Amen? The hope of glory. Praise the Lord. We don't, we don't do anything except believe. He's done it all. He's covered it all completely. That's why we can have joy. That's why we can have peace. That's why we can be comfortable. Because we don't have to be laboring and working and measuring and judging ourselves constantly about, well, I had a good day today, but I was 
Well, I wasn't too good yesterday, and this morning I really lost it, but this afternoon I worked a little harder. We're always in the favor of God. We're always the beloved. We're always measured as if we were Jesus. In Christ, we are the righteousness of God. Amen. Amen. We are perfect. We are the beloved. We are accepted. We are the offspring of God. Look at 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 and 4. It's the assurance of knowing this. We can lay our head down. We can have a bad day. We can be not such good people. And you can still lay your head down at night. And the scripture says that God gives his children rest. He gives them sleep. It's a blessing. You don't have to lay awake all night tossing and turning and, you know, grieving over some stupid thing you did or some, you know, not so wise remark. Hey, relax. Relax. It's okay. God has handled it. You can go on tomorrow as if it's the first day of perfection without ever looking back. You know, someone was saying, you know, when we have a bad thing come into our life, a bad situation, a bad circumstance, and they do happen. Jesus said, in this world you'll have tribulation. But he also said, be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. But when something negative happens, a lot of times we look at our life and we say, okay, what, what brought that on? You know, that's what the enemy will do. He'll say, well, you know, it was that thing you said to your boss. It was that remark you made to a, you know, a, a passerby. It was, you know, some, something you did. You cut somebody off in traffic. You, you cursed. You got angry. You lost your temper for a minute. You did this or you did that. Or, or you didn't believe perfectly for something. And so, some negative, and then we immediately say, okay, see, God is, because God chastises those he loves. So he must be, this is punishment for my bad behavior. That's not true. What God does, he never sees the negative in your life. He doesn't. Regardless of what you may think, he only sees you as perfect. And so if, in fact, he chastises those whom he loves, it is for the future. In other words, he prepares us because of whatever that circumstance is. He doesn't bring the circumstance. He didn't bring the bad thing. He uses that to promote us forward, to prepare us for what he has for us in the future. I was talking about when we were cleaning construction sites, it would have been real easy. And don't think that the thought never came to my mind when we're throwing broken two-by-fours into dumpsters and you know cleaning up the glue off the kitchen cabinets and scraping the floors and vacuuming doing all that kind of stuff and hauling off lumber and all that, that I didn't say in my mind, uh, I thought you had my back here, Lord, and this exceeding great reward looks a lot like just an eight-hour job. <laughs> it doesn't look much like a reward right now. It looks like payment for services rendered, you know. But it, God was using that to show me that he, hey, he didn't have to give me that. I mean, I could have been standing on a corner somewhere hoping to get a job somewhere. He provided a means by which I could have support and meet my obligations until something better came. It, it was a projection for it. It wasn't a punishment for something. It was a blessing. It was moving me on in the path that he had provided. I painted, I don't know, what, two houses, three houses that, that, uh, during that time? One of them just up the street from where I live. A new house had been built just quarter of a mile, half a mile up this road from where I live. Painted the exterior of it. Painted, we did most of the in, interior painting and, and cleaning on it. And uh, hey, it was money. I mean, it, it wasn't bad money. It wasn't my calling, <laughs> praise the Lord, but it wasn't a bad job. I got to work myself. I could talk to God all day long without people thinking I was a complete lunatic. I couldn't just kind of work at my own pace. It was, it, as far as work goes, it was a pretty good job. It wasn't a bad job. I had a lot worse, believe me. But God used that to, to help me, to prepare me for what he wanted. You know what? You, it's hard to be, if you just got the blessing, and I'm not saying God doesn't do this sometimes. Would we really appreciate it, you know? You know what I'm saying? If you grow up and you always have everything handed to you, at some point you get to the place where you just believe 
somebody ought to be handing me something. It's about time for somebody to hand, give me a hand out here, or to, you know, just you know, give me this or give me that. But when you when you have to do things that you don't really want to do, then when better things come, you really appreciate it. You really see it for what it is, and you can also relate to the person who isn't there yet. Amen. And you understand it's nothing about them. It's about the process. I mean, it doesn't make them a bad person because they're not in the same place you're at. You were there in some way or another. Suzanne, I know you can relate to this. Jobs that didn't pay the greatest, didn't get the most respect. But, hey, it's a process. God had a plan, right? And, and that's the way it is for all of us. He has a plan, a way of moving us from one place to another. And he uses the moment to propel us to the next level, to the next place he's trying to take us to. We have to learn to trust him in the moment. Believe that he's good. Believe that he's going to keep his word, that he's going to do all that he said he would do. So according as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these, by the promises, we might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Now, how do we, how, what, the, the precious promises are given unto us, precious promises. The reason for the promises is so that we might become more like God. Not just to get the blessing, which is part of it, we're going to get the blessing, but how do we become more like God? God is a God of faith. He operates only by faith. He saw darkness, he spoke light. His faith is perfect faith. Whatever he says, it is. If it wasn't before, it is now. He cannot lie. Why? Because whatever comes out of his mouth is true. Yep. If it wasn't the fact before, it is a fact. The moment he says it, it's the truth. Mm -hmm. Amen? So he's telling us the way he, the way he makes us more like him, the, more, the way he transforms us is by his promises. Yes. So he gives us a promise so what? We can believe. We can believe the promise so that I can be like God, so that I can operate like God. Jesus was operating like God in the flesh. How did he do it? He simply believed God. Whatever God said, he believed it. It happened. People got healed. People got delivered. People get saved. Amen? We've got to see ourselves the same way. It's God doing the work, as we read earlier. But he does it through us. Christ in us, the hope of glory. Praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. So Peter's talking about this correct connection here between everything we enjoy, amen, all the promises, regardless of what they are, healing, deliverance, prosperity, financial, specific situations and circumstances, there's a connection there between being like God and just being outside of God. The godliness that we talk of in church often is about you know, per perfect morality. When in fact the godliness that God is talking about is partakers of his divine nature. How do we become partakers of the divine nature? It's not anything we're doing, it's something we're believing. Amen? He's already done it. Yes. We just believe it. Amen. Look at John chapter 10, verse 10. The thief comes but to steal, to kill, and to destroy. Anytime there's death, anytime there's loss, anytime there's destruction, mark it down, it's the devil. It is not God correcting, it's not God punishing, it's the enemy. It's the devil coming to rob to steal, and to kill. Amen? Now, God will use anything the devil meant for evil, God will still use it for good. This young man, I say young man because he's younger than me, praise the Lord, that just passed away tragically in our parking lot. The devil meant it for evil. He'll, he'll try to bring sorrow and sadness and depression and grief to other people. But I can promise you this, Mr. Murphy is as happy as as he would ever be, ever could be, ever dreamed of being. He's not grieving. Mm -hmm. Well,
what the enemy meant for evil, God turned it for good. Paul said, amen, to die is gain. Amen. To live is Christ. Yes. It's hard for us to fathom that because we've got to deal with a loss in this life. I've lost a brother. I've lost a sister. I've lost a father. I know what it's like. And there's always the void. There's always that emptiness. But I promise you, you couldn't drag them back here. You couldn't force them back here. There's no power anywhere on earth, above or beneath, outside of God himself, that would ever cause them to come back. They are where their hearts, their spirits have always longed to be. Amen? It looks like terror. It looks like horror. It looks like bad for those that are left behind. But for that individual, as a believer, they've got where we're all striving for. They're already where we want to be one day. Now, I'm not pressing, pushing the info. I'm not in a hurry because God will bless me here in this life. You understand what I'm saying? But, but once that happens, I remember Smith Wigglesworth. Anybody, y'all know, heard of Smith Wigglesworth? He, he wrote one time, his wife died, and he prayed for God to bring her back. She died. She just died, had a heart attack or something. And he laid hands on her and prayed, You're, you'll not die, you'll live and not die. She came back to life, and the first thing she said was, Oh, Smith, his name was Smith Wiggins. Oh, Smith, why did you bring me back? She wasn't happy. She wasn't having a, a big party about, Oh, thank the Lord, I'm still alive. She'd already been, and she didn't want to come back. Amen? And so I, I'm just saying, it's hard in this realm. It's hard on this side to see the perfection. The beauty, there's no sadness there. There's no sorrow. I know we think here, well, if I die, I'll miss my grandkids. I'll miss my wife. I'll miss my brothers. I'll miss... You, but you won't. You won't. And believe me, for them that have already gone to be with the Lord, no time passes. It's not like they're up there twiddling their thumbs going, geez, whew, how much longer is it going to be before they get up here? I mean, we're waiting for this homecoming in this place. No, it, there, there is no time there. So it's not like they're standing around going, come on, it's been six years, three months, two weeks, five days, 23 hours. No, it's, it's just all is now. When we, when we show up, whether it's 30 years from now, 20 years from now, 10 years from now, whatever it is, it'll be as though they just got there and they turn and here we are. There's, there is no sorrow there. They're not up there wringing their hands about, oh, I wish I was with them and I could do something. No, that's, that's what we do. Right. Amen? He came that we might have life and that we might have it more abundantly. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. All of our experiences are based in our being in Christ. They're not based on what we do. They're not based on what we don't do. They're based on being in Christ. If you're a believer, you are in Christ. Amen. If you're in Christ, you are the righteousness of God. Hallelujah. You are perfect. Amen. Amen. In God's eyes. Amen. You can do no wrong. You talk about spoiled brats. <laughs> Amen. Hey, we've got a guy, we've got a daddy who just spoils us rotten. If you think about it. Amen. He gives us without us doing anything for him. And he loves to do it. He loves to bless his children. Amen? And he just uses life to teach us. When something bad comes, he said, now that, you see, this happens, but I'm not leaving you here. I'm going to use the negative to move you to the next blessing, to move you to the next level of your life. Amen? Amen? He, he's not saying, see what an idiot you were and you got yourself into this, get yourself out. That's not, that's not the way our Father works. He sees that as that's the enemy, that's what the devil does, and I'm not let, I'll never leave you or forsake you. Nobody can take you out of my hand. And I'll use that situation to slap the devil in the face and move you to the next blessing. Praise the Lord. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, 5 through 7.
So casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ and having in a readiness to revenge all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. Now that almost give you a headache just reading that. Having in a readiness to revenge all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. How did our obedience get fulfilled? In Christ. Right? So every time, be ready to revenge disobedience. Whenever you are not perfect, whenever you are quote-unquote disobedient, and the enemy immediately comes to steal, kill, destroy, condemn, you be ready to revenge that disobedience because your obedience is fulfilled. You don't let the devil beat you up with your failure because this isn't about your works. It's about the perfect work of Jesus. You point him, amen, you show him the perfect obedience of Christ that God declares is yours. That's your revenge. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. You get to enforce it, but he is the one, amen, who provided it. Praise the Lord. Verse 7. Do you look on things after the outward appearance? This is just a continuation of that thought. If any man trusts to himself that he is Christ, let him of himself think this again, that as he is Christ, even so are we Christ. Hallelujah. That's the context in which he's speaking. We got it. We're perfect. And you are, so am I. That's what Paul's saying. You got to believe that about yourself. And you got to believe it about me. As believers, that's what he talks, says in another place. He says, I, uh, from now on, he said, from the time I got born again, I only see Christ. I don't see anybody but Jesus. He's trying to operate like God because that's what God sees. I look at Dean. I don't see Dean. I see Christ because that's what Christ sees. I don't see Suzanne. I see Christ. I don't see Sally. I see Christ. I don't see Roberto. I see Christ. I don't see Cindy, I see Christ. I don't see Mike, I see Christ. You see what I'm saying? Because here's the deal. When we do that, there's a big problem. We talk about communion. Communion isn't something we do on a regular basis here, although you can take communion yourself anytime you want to. And we try to do it. Uh, we, we should do it more than we do, but, we, we, but here's the point I'm trying to make. When the scripture talks about communion, it says there are many among you who are sick, and even some who sleep. And meaning they're dead in Christ. They're not dead, but they're just not alive in the flesh. And he said the reason for that is because you don't discern the body. Mm-hmm. Right? right? The reason for that is when Dean prays for me, I don't believe Dean's prayers have any power. Wow. Huh? Well, you know, we've got to have so-and-so pray. We need Benny Hinn. You know, we need somebody else. No, that's not the, the answer is you are in Christ's stead. Right. You can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. If I see Christ in Dean, I'm going to say, yeah, I, hey, I covered your prayers. Yeah. Why? Because you have influence with God the same as Jesus does. If I don't recognize that, I'm cutting myself off from access you know, to, to God's blessings, to God's healing, to God's deliverance. Mm-hmm. A church of this size, a church of our size, you, you can have healing here just as quickly as you can have in the mega church. If the people don't, you know, deny or misunderstand uh, the body. Right. Right. If you're a believer, you have power Amen. to lay hands on the sick and see them recover. Yeah. You can help me through my trial. You can, get, you can give me peace where there is no peace. You can help me to, you know, revelation where I'm struggling to find the will of God. Yep. Amen. I need to see that you're Christ. I need to look at you as Christ. I need to judge you as though you were Christ. Amen? Okay, uh, let's look at uh, last scripture here. Colossians chapter 2, uh, verse 19. And we'll go from 19 right down through chapter 3, verse 3. It's only like five or six verses, but beginning at Colossians chapter 2, verse 19. I, I'd have to look. I think it's 21 or 22. 23. 23, okay. And go right on down through chapter 3, verse 3.
So, not holding the head from which all the body by joints and bands having nourishment ministered and knit together increaseth with the increase of God. So everything, holding the head, that's Christ, but from which all the body by joints and bands having nourishment ministered. They, they, the, you know, King James almost talks backwards, but it's saying that all this ministry, all this nourishment comes from the head. Right? right. Because it's by it that the body, joints, and bands ha are nourished have nourishment ministered to it, right? And they're knit together by the same thing. Increaseth with the increase of God. Wherefore, if you be dead with Christ from the rudiments of the world, why, as though living in the world, are you subject to ordinances? Right? You're connected with Christ. Everything about you comes from the head, which is Jesus. Well, if you're connected with him, then you're dead with him, as far as the world is concerned, as far as the law is concerned. He fulfilled the law. He completed it as far as believers are concerned, right? Touch not, taste not, handle not, which all are to perish with the using after the commandments and doctrines of men. Not God, but men. Which things have indeed a show of wisdom in will worship. Will worship is you worshiping your self-will, your, your determination. You know, I'll get it done. You know, I'm going to, I'll do it. I'll, 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 I'll make it happen. I'll will myself through this. You understand what I'm saying? That's will worship. It's self-idolatry is what it really amounts to. And humility and neglecting of the body. Not in any honor to the satisfying of the flesh. It doesn't do you any good anyway. Which things have indeed a show of wisdom in will worship and humility. All right? If ye then be risen with Christ... Seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. What things are above? All those promises. Amen? Seek those promises. Not your self-effort, but what God has promised, where Christ sits on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. In other words, set your, set your sights on the spiritual, on the promises of God, and not on the works of the flesh. And the works of the flesh are not just the evil, it's the self-effort. Amen? For you are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. Amen. So it just in that verse, it sums up everything I've been saying here t tonight. As far as God is concerned, this is dead, my real life, who I really am, the spirit man that I am, is hidden with Christ in God. I've already gone back to the Lord. I'm already with the Lord from where I came. Amen. We were buried with him, but the scripture says we were in Christ before the foundation of the world. <coughs> because there's no beginning or ending with God, God knew before the foundation of the world who would be saved, even though he didn't make him saved. He just knew who would. So in the mind of God... We've always been in Christ and will always be in Christ. Yes. There was just one point in time where we had to assent, uh, 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 agree to that in the natural, in time, which is what we call being born again. Praise the Lord. Amen. But it's all about him. He says we are perfect. Why? Because I'm dead and my life is hid in Christ in God. That's the good news. Praise the Lord. That's the gospel. And that's what this world needs to hear. It isn't about, well, you're so much further gone than I was. Or I didn't have all the same hang-ups that you have. Well, I probably did, but I'm just using that as an example. But the reality is you can look that person in the eye, no matter where they are, no matter how, how despicable, how, how messed up, how, how utterly, you know, uh, useless and hopeless their life might seem and you can look them in the eye and you can say with all honesty, not with some religious hype, but in all honesty you can say God loves you and he'll save you right now without you making any change in your life except to say I need you Jesus Amen. and that second they can be saved Amen. that's what the world needs to hear they don't need to hear the 10 steps to Jesus through the catechism, through the you know, doctrinal teachings of this church or that church or some other church. They need to know that God gave his life for them right then, right now, right where you're at in the middle of all this crap. 
God loves you. He loves you. Now that's inconceivable for most people because they either don't know anything about God or what they do know about God is so distorted by the church that they believe they've got to, uh, God won't have anything to do with me because I'm such a mess. My God, everybody's a mess as far as he's concerned. There are no, you know, we, we have gradations. We have levels of what we think are really bad and what's really, hey, it's either, you're either in or you're out. Doesn't matter how far out, you're just out. We, we think, well, because they're on crack or they're on this or they're that or they got a, you know, sexual deal going and there's some prostitute or this. Look, he never made distinctions in that way. You either believe or you don't believe. If you don't believe, you're lost. And who cares why? You're just lost. And the moment a person accepts Christ, there's no, he doesn't remember. It's gone. It's over. And it's, our, it's an obligation to us as the church to be like Christ when it comes to that. You can't go, well, you know, I, I mean, I love you in the Lord, but come on, I know where you've been. Look, if all of us were really honest about our lives, whoa, we'd have plenty to talk about all night. You know, and not to each other, but when we get home, I never thought Suzanne, I mean, come on, and, and you know, gee whiz, and Sally, and really? I mean, he's the pastor's wife, and, and Nathan, my God, really? I, come on. I mean, I understand the drugs, the alcohol, but... Uh. Well, I'll give you something to think about tonight. But, but I'm just saying, in the eyes of God, that's how ridiculous this is. And we need to be as honest with people as God has been with us. Amen. They need a life-changing experience. Yeah. And the only way that comes, it won't come through religion. It won't come through some program. Programs are good. Religions are good in their place. But people need God. They need the truth of God. They need the love of God. They need the power of God to transform them. And we're the only ones that can give it to them because we're the body. We're what he has left here. We just got to be honest. Share the love. Be happy. Hallelujah. Give the Lord a hand clap. Thank you. Praise the Lord. Everybody we look at, anybody we look at, you look at them and you look at them with hope. You look at them with an expectation that, you know what, I can't wait to see what God's going to do in their life. can't wait to see how God is glorified in their life. Amen? Amen. And then watch God do it. Praise the Lord. God bless everybody. Thanks for being here tonight. You are dismissed.